Well, I want to say hi to everyone here in our sanctuary, those watching uh, from Knox or online. Great to have you with us uh, as well. Uh, If you're new with us today, really glad that you are here. Uh, We are in a series called The Big Five, where we're looking at these values, these distinctives that we have uh, as a church. Who who are we as a ward church? And so we've been talking about thoughtful theology, this idea that all questions are welcomed here, uh, and we try to live into that life uh, of faith that Jesus called us to. And then secondly, audacious generosity, that we live open-handedly receiving all good gifts uh, from God. And so today, uh, I'd like to talk to you about global reach, global reach. And we've been talking about this as leaders with our elders, and as they have gotten passionate about this, as they are excited about you knowing our values, um, they, uh, we took a little video of them sharing their own uh, thoughts on Global Reach, so watch the screens. I think Ward has in our, in our DNA uh, a mission love uh, for the rest of the world. Our God is a missional God. Uh, proclaimed through Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And uh, it gave me a a better understanding of our role in supporting both with treasure and time and prayer, uh, the global reach that God has planned for us. As followers of Christ, we're really called to bless all nations. It's really important to be able to lean into um, God's work globally here and beyond in the areas of justice um, and charity and spreading his word. Uh, it's exciting to me that to know that we continue to uphold uh, God's uh, love for everybody in the world for um, a- as one of our primary values here at, at Ward Church. Jesus asked us to, to share him with the world and we can do that through all sorts of ways. Ward's covers that across the street and around the world mentality. When I hear the the value of global reach, I love how that can mean something as simple as taking care of the neighbor down the street when they have a need and can be be as broad as the missionaries that we support that are going to the ends of the earth full time. Uh, And it means everything in between there as well. I love how we have short-term mission trip opportunities that that anyone that's a member here or part of our community can be part of those trips as well. So we share God's heart for the nations, this message of Jesus to be proclaimed. Uh, But what we're also realizing is that the nations are moving into our neighborhoods. They're becoming our neighbors. And so what are we called to do about it to the nations and to our neighborhoods? Well, the passage that was read earlier kind of spells that out for us. And what we look at first is uh, from this passage is the extent of the reach. Uh, Secondly, the purpose for the reach. Third, the critique before the reach. And then last, the motivation in the reach. So the extent, the purpose, the critique, and the motivation. So first, the extent of the reach. Um, if you're here and you're not a Christian or you're new to faith, this, this passage of Scripture has commonly been called the Great Commission. Uh, that uh, Jesus has uh, risen from the dead. He's about to ascend uh, to the Father's right hand. Uh, and he is giving his final terms to his followers. And he says here uh, in this passage, verse 19, he says, I, Go, therefore, to all nations. And, uh, you know, when we hear all nations, we shouldn't think of nation states, but this Greek word, ethne, means all peoples. Go, therefore, to all peoples. And I'm going to make a claim this morning. Feel free to disagree with me, but the reality is I believe that there is a unique piece to the Christian faith, that Christianity is the most diverse of all the religions in the world. It reaches more peoples than any other religion, to the point that Dr. Richard Balkum, who teaches at uh, the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, said this, uh, almost certainly Christianity exhibits more cultural diversity than any other religion, and that must say something about it. I have more stats in my head right now than you would ever want to know on this topic, uh, but the reality of what I want to summarize is that Christianity's beauty is in its flexibility. And it's exploding right now among all peoples. 
It's exploding in South America. It's exploding in Africa. It's exploding in Asia. It's truly going to all peoples because Christianity is the most flexible of all religions. It's not connected to one particular group or culture, but it's meant to infuse itself into all peoples. It is for the nations. And so you may be saying, well, Tyler, why do we have to reach them? Why do we have to go to them? Well, that brings us to the second point. What's the purpose of the reach? Uh, and, and Jesus tells us in this passage, he says, there is one purpose for why I am sending you to all peoples. And it's this, to make disciples, to make disciples. Now, I, I actually struggle to understand what the word disciple actually means. You may be here or watching uh, online. You may struggle to know what disciple means, but the best way I've heard it described is the word to use there is apprentice. An apprentice is probably the best language, that when you're an apprentice, you're, you're learning the craft from a teacher, so what you could then learn to be like the teacher And so those who are apprenticing to Jesus are following Jesus, the teacher, learning to be like the teacher. And so this has extraordinary claims for for our lives. How are we truly living? Are we making disciples, making disciples of Jesus? Now, you may be here and you may be saying to yourself, this is the exact thing I hate about religion. This is the exact thing I hate about Christianity. These these arrogant claims to be the exclusive truth holder. These arrogant claims that Jesus is the only way. That Jesus is the only way to God. All religion is just the different face of the same God. All religion is really just different paths to the same God. You may... You may actually believe that uh, here today, um, or or you may have heard this objection. Um, But uh, there's a parable told that kind of connects to this objection. You may have heard it before. It's the story of the blind men, the elephant, and the king. You may have heard this, and it goes like this. Uh, There were these blind men, um, and uh, they were all uh, touching a piece of the elephant. Um, One was, was touching the trunk of the elephant, and he said, oh, God is like a snake, and then another blind man was touching the, the, the leg, the, the leg of the elephant, and he was saying, oh no, God is like a tree, he's like a stump. And then another one was touching the spear, or, or touching the tusk of the elephant, and he was saying, oh, God is like, uh, like a spear. And you know, kind of the, the, the whole analogy goes, they were touching different pieces of the elephant, all believing that they were correct, all believing that they were right. And so they were arguing uh, in kind of declaration, who, who has the correct saying on who God is? And in their commotion, they woke the king. And you never wake the king. I never wake the king. But the king stands up over them and says, listen, listen, you all are, have a piece of the truth. You all are, are partly right. Really, it's an elephant. If you come all together, you'll see that what little piece of truth you have, it, it goes together. You see, this is uh, what you may be saying. It's like, yeah, this is what all religion is. It's just different paths up the same mountain. They, everyone has a piece of the truth, but really it's the elephant. And uh, what do we say to this? Well, Leslie Newbegin, who was a missionary in India, this parable of the blind man and the elephant and the king uh, was actually originated in India. Uh, and so Leslie Newbegin heard this as he was a missionary there. And uh, people would come to him and say, you know, Leslie, uh, why be so exclusionary on Jesus? Why, why be so arrogant? Don't you see God is like an elephant? Now, what was Newbegin's response? He said this, this story, this parable is told to neutralize religious truth claims. The, the idea is that they would say to us, how could you be so arrogant to claim you have the truth? But as Newbegin said, don't you see the real arrogance is the one who claims to see the whole elephant, who claims to not be blind, who claims to have the whole picture on reality. You see, don't, don't you see the person who says to you or me who, who would have this view of Jesus, they would say, no one should have exclusionary, exclusionary truth claims, exclusive truth claims. But they themselves, when they say that, are making an exclusive truth claim. That they would say to you, it, it's arrogant for you to think that you know the way But then the arrogance actually lies in the one who says they can see the whole elephant, that they are the only one who has the picture of ultimate reality. And so it's inconsistent. Now, you may be saying, well, Tyler, yeah, that's Christians always interpret the facts the way they want them. 
They're always spinning it the way they want. Of course, you're going to find Leslie Newbing in a missionary, but, but it's not always that way. And I actually beg to differ. Uh, in fact, there are many people who are not Christian who would say the exact same thing, that all religions are not the different paths up the same mountain. In fact, Stephen Prothero, who's a professor of religion at Boston University, studied at Yale, studied at Harvard, non-Christian, says that uh, he wrote in his book, God is not one. He said this, this idea that we have in our world right now out of the nature of tolerance that uh, really religion is just different paths up the same mountain is not true. Uh, when we look at the individual claims of each religion, when we look at the doctrines, the sacred texts, it is very clear we are not talking about different paths up the same mountain. We are talking about different mountains altogether. In fact, what he says is, all of these religions, all of these religions claim that there's a path that you work up to the top of the mountain to get your reward. You work up to get to God. You work up to get enlightenment. You work up to get your blessing, except one. You see, Christianity is fundamentally different. Every other religion says to you, you need to work your way up to God, but Christianity says God came down, came down the mountain all the way down to you and to me. It's fundamentally different. And you, you may be here this morning saying, well, you know, Tyler, actually, I've actually been with you the whole time. I'm in full agreement with you. I mean, uh, I, yeah, go to the nations, bring the gospel there. Uh, it's the message exclusively of Jesus. I, I've actually been with you the whole time. You know, you could probably save the rest of your minutes for the sermon, sit down, and we leave early today. You shouldn't shake your head so fast. I mean, that just makes me feel bad. Not so fast. Not so fast. You see, we have to hear this critique before the reach. It's, it's actually God's critique for us that we need to hear. And it, and it comes from verse 18. It says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Have you ever been someplace in your life where there are just too many people in charge in that setting or in that circumstance? Um, just too many, too, many, too many people involved. Too, too many cooks in the kitchen. Too many people wanting to be in charge. The, the best example, and this always happens to me because I'm a pastor, is when I show up for wedding rehearsals. Uh, when I show up for the wedding rehearsal, you have this bride. Uh, the bride has her desires, her, her dreams, her requests, uh, but really her demands. Uh, and then you have the mom. Mom's got her own desire. She's been dreaming about this day too. She has her own dreams, her own wish, her own requests, demands. And then you've got the wedding coordinator. Their, their, their job is to uh, take care of the wedding in that sanctuary. They, they've been doing it for years. They have a certain template that they follow uh, for every wedding that comes through. They have their own ideas of how that wedding should go. And guess what? They're all in conflict with each other. And the poor wedding party and grandma are sitting there wondering, who, 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 am I to, who am I following? Who am I to listen to? There are too many, there are too many people in charge. And the reality is, the same thing is going on in your life. You see, inside your head and your soul, there are too many people in charge. And Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There's an 18th century philosopher named John Jacques Rousseau. And really, uh, the, the main piece of his contribution was this idea of what does it mean to be human? And he believed that the human was the, uh, superior to all animals. And, and really, the human was, was free at its essence to be and to do whatever it wanted to be. Uh, you can hear Rousseau saying, you are the authority. You are in charge. You are the captain of your own ship. You can do whatever you want to do. But later on in his life, actually in 1762, uh, Rousseau penned these words in his book, The Social Construct. It says this, Man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. 
Do you hear what Rousseau found, this revelation that he came to later in his life? He said, me being the authority over my life only brought bondage. Me, me being the, the sovereign ruler over my life only brought me ruin. In his book, Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis says, there are only three fundamental ways that, that we can live in this universe. There are only three fundamental ways. The first is to be God, to be the ruler of all the universe, the rightful king. The second is to be like God, those who would live under the reign of God as a child of God, longing to be like him, longing to live the holy life that God exudes. To be God, to be like God, And the third way to live is to be miserable. To long to be king of the universe, to long to be the authority over all the universe when you are not God is to be miserable. And this morning, friends, the question to ask yourself is, who is the true authority over your life? Inside your head and inside your soul, is there a debate waging between who's really in charge? To be God to be like God, or to be miserable are the only ways we can live in this universe. Now, I know what someone's saying. Oh, but Tyler, I'm a religious person. I mean, I I come to church, I read my Bible, I pray. I'm, I'm I'm not one of those miserable people. And what we learn through the Gospels and Jesus' ministry is that some of the most miserable people are religious. Some of, the, some of those in, in chains the most are the religious people. You see, Jesus came and he said, there's a, there's a way for you to live that you're invited into, and it's a life with me. Um, and, but the people who struggled to put down their authority the most were not the prostitutes. It was not the unclean lepers. The people who struggled to put down their own authority were the religious leaders. And this is why, friends, we, we really need to hear this critique See, God has to get the religion out of us if we're going to be of any use at all. Uh, He has to get the religion out of us because if not, we're going to do more harm than if we did nothing at all. Because we've all been there or we've heard the stories. You know, when a religious person shares Jesus with someone else, you know, we've been there or we've we've done it or we've seen it. I've done it. But when a religious person shares Jesus with someone, the subtext of what they're saying is, uh, I'm right, and you were wrong, and don't you wish you were more like me? I'm right, you're wrong, and, and don't you wish you were more like me? And see, we have to hear Jesus' critique before it's too late. In 1984, there was a movie that came out, one best picture of that year, called Amadeus. And it's the story of these two composers, Mozart and Salieri. And, and Salieri was a religious man. He, he longed to give God glory uh, with his work. And then there is the arrogant, obnoxious Mozart. And, and Salieri says, uh, God, I, I will give you my religious life. I'll be obedient to you. I give you my morality. Just make me great. And and at the same time, you have this man, at least in terms of the movie, Mozart, who definitely did not have the religious commitment that Salieri had. But Salieri essentially said, hey, I'm religious. I'm going to give you my good performance. I'm going to give you my good record. I'm going to pray to you. I'm 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 going to give you all the glory. Just give me what I want. And what you find as the movie goes on is the gift that Salieri prays for, that the life that he lives so obediently to get, that gift is not given to him, but is given to Mozart. And, and so what you find is the movie, uh, uh, there's a scene in the movie where Salieri is standing, looking at a wall, and there's a crucifix on the wall. And when he realizes the gift he, he had lived so fervently for is not going to come to him, he looks at this crucifix on the wall, and he says out loud to God, from now on, we are enemies, you and I. And he takes the crucifix off the wall, and he throws it in the fire. You see, uh, despite his religious performance, despite his moral record, despite the chastity through which he lived his life, Salieri was still the authority over his life. Salieri was still in charge. It wasn't God's will, it was Salieri's will. And so this morning, friends, we need to allow that question uh, to critique us. Allow us to ask that question, who's the true authority over my life? 
Who's really in charge inside my soul? Uh, Because Jesus is saying to us, you're fooling yourself if you don't think you have a tendency to religion. We're fooling ourselves. See, there's a place in all of us where we need to hear this critique. For the irreligious person here today, um, your critique is living for the freedom, like Rousseau said, that I am the charge. I am the captain of my own ship. I determine my fate only to find, really, it's brought you chains. And for some of us to hear Jesus' critique of our religious life, really, we've, we've, we've lived this dutiful life only to have God in our debt because, because ultimately we, have, we, we want things out of life and, and he's a means to an end. But what happens when those things don't come? What happens when the things we sought for, like solitary, don't come true? Do we, do we shake our fist at God and say, I've been so good for you. I've prayed to you. I've given you this moral life of mine. Who's really the authority? And so the question then for us is, what does the irreligious person do with their shame because they've lived for themselves? And what does the religious person do with their pride because they've had God in their pocket the whole time? It's really been their will, not God's will. What, what do we do with that? How do we have a global reach that isn't a self-reach? How do we have a global reach that isn't a self-reach? How do we share Jesus uh, without beating people up with how great we are? Well, that brings us to the final point in Matthew. And Matthew says, there's an encounter. There's an encounter that the people had, and there's an encounter that we must have with this man, Jesus. It says this in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. You see, these disciples had an encounter and, and, and when they encounter Jesus, this man that they thought was dead, he's now risen in their midst. It says here they, they worshiped him. So the question is, why did they worship him? And what does that have to do with global reach? And friends, I want to tell you today, it means everything. But the more exhaustive answer to that question is actually found by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. You see, in the book of Revelation, John tells us about a scroll It's a scroll that is written front to back. And on the scroll, it contains all of God's purposes for all eternity. The purposes of how God will remake this broken world. The purposes for where God will set all things right. But the problem is that there is no one found who is worthy to open this scroll. No one who has the authority to open its seals and to read this scroll. And so John weeps. And this passage, it says, not only does he weep, but it says John wept and wept. John is sobbing because there's no one with the authority to open the scroll. No one with the authority to carry out God's purposes for all eternity. No one who can set things right from it's the suffering which John knows in his world. And in that place, we read this in chapter 5 of Revelation that says this. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. And the people sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. So what we find here is the exact opposite of everything we've believed about what is true authority. The one with the ultimate authority is the one who actually laid it down and gave it up. You see, throughout the Old Testament, we get this picture of a lion who would come and reign, a lion who would rule, a lion who would be king. But what the Apostle John tells us is that lion is actually the lamb, the lamb slain for you and me. And what we learn here from this passage is that 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 lion that was slain brings salvation to you, to me, and to all peoples. And so you see, global reach happens as a response of worship, as a response of when our hearts are moved by what Jesus has done for us. He is the lion, but he's the lamb that was slain. And when we worship him, we worship him because at infinite cost to himself, he bore our punishment, he bore our sin, he bore our shame, to set us free, to redeem us, to satisfy us, to make us his. As the great hymn says, amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, would die for me? 
Has the gospel become real to you? Do you want to sing like the people in Revelation? Are you thirsty and looking to be satisfied? Then you will need to surrender your life before the lion who is the lamb. And when you do, global reach will just happen through you. Not because you are great and competent, but because Jesus is. Not because you are strong and mighty, but because Jesus is. You'll be simply somebody telling other people who are thirsty where you found the stream. And see, this story happened over and over again in the life of Jesus. People who encountered him, people who gave their life to him, people who surrendered themselves before the lion who is the lamb. That when they, when they came before him, they went, they couldn't help telling others about the final, the stream that would satisfy. And from now on, through all eternity, we will worship the lion who is the lamb. And in his presence, the Bible says, his fullness of joy. I want to invite our elders or our ushers forward to uh, receive our offering. Um, as I close, C.S. Lewis wrote a story about a lion named Aslan. And in his story, Aslan is the Christ figure of the book. And there is this encounter that takes place. Uh, is an encounter that all of us must have with the lion in this life or in the life to come. And he writes this. Are you not thirsty? Friends, are you thirsty today? Are you not thirsty, said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I, would you mind going away while I do? The lion answered only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I come, said Jill? I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step near her. Do you eat girls, he, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. I dare not come dr and drink then, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. Jill is dying of thirst, and she comes to the only stream, but she knows she must bow before the lion if she wants to drink. And this morning, you and I are invited to come as well, to come to the stream, to bow before the lion, who is the lamb, and to drink the only waters that will satisfy the waters of salvation for every tribe and every tongue and every people and every nation. Let's pray. And so, Father, may we worship you this morning. For the lion is the lamb. We have nothing to offer except that we've found the stream. And maybe for the first time, may we drink and know that all power and glory and authority belong to the Lion, who is the Lamb. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.